Welcome to Christ Community Church. My name is Randy Harkins. I am the senior pastor of Christ Community Church here in Atkins, Texas. I want to welcome you uh, to be with us today, and I just want to tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, we've been a church for over 20 years. I've been uh, privileged to be a pastor here for over 20 years, and I serve with a, a marvelous group of people here. Amen. And my name is uh, Brian Harkins. I'm an associate pastor here at Christ Community Church. And we uh, don't want to be a community church in name only. So we strive to uh, not only personally seek the Lord, but, but also to reach out into the community and, and be a blessing to others. The focus of our attention in this church, we've always tried to uh, put the Word of God first beyond everything else. And uh, so we, we pay close attention to that. Uh, we have uh, awesome times of worship in the presence of the Lord without uh, hype, just seek to simply worship the Lord. And we uh, emphasize uh, fellowship with one another. We welcome people of all different backgrounds, uh, races, different situations, and we just want people to know that we're here together as community to point you to the Lord, to let you know that Jesus loves you, and uh, we pray that you would seek the Lord with us. We're glad that you stopped in, and if you're ever uh, able to come in person, we'd love to have you. Good evening and God bless you, Christ Community Church. A welcome to all those who are joining here in person and those who might be joining online. I'm excited to worship him and praise him tonight and to hear his word. Amen? Amen. There's a scripture with this season, with the Resurrection Sunday and Good Friday coming this Friday and we celebrate his resurrection on Sunday. This scripture has been strong on my heart for a few weeks and it's Ephesians 2, 4 through 5 and it says, but God... Uh, who is rich in his mercy because of his great love with which he loved us um, because of who we are he even when we were dead in our trespasses he made us alive together in Christ and it's that alive together in Christ that brings such a joy in my heart and that joy brings my heart hope because of his life within us and because of that hope I choose to trust him 
Amen. How about you? And so tonight we're going to praise him. We're going to worship him. And let's just uh, sing our praises as we choose to trust him.
desire, Lord, to talk with you, and more importantly, to hear your voice speaking to us, Lord. Lord, we ask that you would birth within us, Lord, a greater thirst, a greater desire for the things of heaven, a greater desire to be pleasing to you in all of our ways, Lord, to have these places where we sit beside still waters, so to speak, and we, we just listen for your voice. We listen to what you want to speak to us. Lord, I confess to you that that's the greatest need of my heart, Lord is to hear and to know your voice speaking to me. Speaking to me of promises of scripture from your word. May we hear you in a, in a still small voice expressing your love for us as your, your children. We thank you, Lord, for the promise that we are seated with you in heavenly places in Christ Jesus that you have already prepared a, a place for us to talk to you. We are seated with you. And you say elsewhere that we are a holy priesthood, a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people set apart for you, Lord. 
so I'm just asking Lord that you would hear the cry of our heart for more of you as the deer panteth for the water so my soul longeth after thee Desire and I long to worship thee. Sing that again. As the deer panted for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. and I long to worship Thee. You alone are my strength, my shield. To You alone may my spirit yield. You and I long to worship Thee. You're my friend and you are my brother even though you are a king. I love you
you Lord Jesus. Lord we come before you tonight Lord God. You know every need. You know every struggle. You know every heart. Lord you know every desire of the heart. And so God I just pray as we come before you tonight Lord there would just be a, a heart's cry within all of us to just say Lord we want to hear from you. We want to we want to seek your face Lord God in your word. We want to come before you, Lord God, humbly and come before you honest and just say, God, we need you. Oh, God, we need you. Lord God, I, I thank you for your heart for your people. God, I, I've been reading in Scripture and just seeing how generation after generation and time after time, God, your faithfulness never fails. God, in our generation is no different. Lord God, your faithfulness will not fail. God, your goodness will not depart from us, Lord God. Because one thing I've seen is you always have a remnant people. No matter how, how corrupt the world gets, God, there's always a Noah. There's, there's always uh, one of those, those ones that just stands, a, a Moses, a, a David. Lord God, a, Apostle Peter or, or 
or Paul or, or just in every day in every generation, you always have a people. You always have a voice. And there is always hope. And so, God, we come before you and just, just say we love you. Lord God, we thank you for the way that you've done things. Lord God, we thank you as we celebrated Palm Sunday this last week. And we'll celebrate Good Friday this Friday. And God, will celebrate your resurrection. John 14 just keeps coming to mind. Because I live, you will live also. Thank you, God, that everything we need for life and godliness, everything in Christ Jesus you've given us, you have poured out on us, Lord God, and we thank you for that. Go before us in your word. Go before us in this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. It's good to be with you this morning, or this afternoon, church, this evening, <laughs> tonight, all of the above. God is good. I don't know if y'all have had a week like I have. It seems like a week and a half <laughs> of just so much going on, but God is so, so faithful. And I'm thankful for his presence. I'm thankful for his provision. First, a special thank you to all those who took part and helped in the playground out there. It came out. It looks awesome. It was so much fun. We literally finished. We walked away, and kids were running out to it. And so it was amazing. Like, uh, Kaleo, they went on recess, the homeschool program. They went on recess 10 minutes after we finished. And it was so much fun to watch all those kids just so excited. And the little kids going, hey, watch me. Watch me cross the, the monkey bars. And I was just so blessed. It made all that work, all that shoveling, all that everything so worth it. So thank you, everybody, that played a part in that uh, or helped with uh, planning it out. Uh, we thank you for your input and your help in all those ways and for praying through it. Uh, God is good. So I had shared with you all a little bit Sunday. I don't think I ever actually finished the thought, but God had given me the title of this. I was telling uh, Brother Roland this today. God had given me the title of Sunday's message, um, like the day of the time change, so two weeks before, and then I had nothing for two full weeks, even praying through it, but I knew I heard from the Lord. And then somewhere around Monday or Tuesday, God just started showing me the revelation of Palm Sunday and Holy Week and Pentecost. And uh, as we come up to Good Friday and we're going to celebrate the resurrection. And then 50 days after that, you have uh, just God's presence uh, poured out in us to dwell within us in the Holy Spirit. So it's such an amazing time that as I started looking at that and studying it, and just thanking the Lord for his perfect plan, uh, God, God kind of helped me with that message. And I believe he wants me to share with you today uh, about Purim. Uh, Purim means lot. And it's because there was a time, and it's, it's benchmarked in the book of Esther, where God's people, as they have throughout many times in history, uh, man was looking to annihilate God's people, to come against them, just a hatred towards them. And uh, we serve a God, and I've entitled the message today, He is able to deliver. He is able to deliver. No matter what your circumstance, no matter what you're going through, when we turn to God and we sit in His presence and we seek His face, He is able to deliver He's able to help. But one thing he wants us to do, and we shared a little bit Sunday, was to come to him honest. we got to come to him as we are. Uh, there's no point in putting up fronts because God sees right through all that. But when we come to him honest and broken, what's so neat is he's such a loving Savior. He, he, it's like a, a father or a mother to a child that's crying. He nestles us. He holds us closer. And sometimes even when we don't see it, even when we don't feel it in the moment, always when we look back, when history is past and we look back, we see his fingerprints, his hands all over it. Oh, as a believer, the older I've gotten in the Lord, I just keep asking him, help me not forget those things. Help me not forget the faithfulness of God. And so I'm thankful for that. Um, so we were talking about change. Uh, the title Sunday was Time Change or a Time of Change. 
And so we read about Palm Sunday and, and Christ coming in to Jerusalem. But what I want to share with you, I want to pick up after the palms have been laid before him. What Jesus does, the very next thing Jesus does, he's been, he's been recognized as a king. He's been recognized as a savior. Hosanna, save us. Save us is that cry. And, and he's done that. What do you think his next thought is? How many earthly kings would be patting themselves on the back and saying, look at the people, how they know how faithful I am. Let, let me take my rightful place as the religious authority. But what does Jesus do? And I want to look at this. Keep in mind, the people just were crying out. And that he goes into the temple. The place that represented God's presence to the people. Uh, Matthew 21, verse 12 through 17. Matthew 21. This is what Jesus does. The very next thing he does, he gets off the colt and he walks into the temple. And it says, And Jesus went into the temple of God and he drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And see, for people looking on the outside, what would they be thinking? If they weren't looking with heavenly eyes, they would be thinking, look, he's coming in by force and taking his throne. He's coming in and, and kicking the, the order of the day out. But it goes on. Jesus, as Jesus always does, there's a reason for it. There's a reason you see this response in our Lord. Verse 13. It says, and he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. You've made it a place of commerce. You made it a place of taking advantage of the poor and the hurting. What I intended to be a place for my presence, for the broken and for the hurting and for those who came in saying, God, if I don't, if I don't meet with you, I'm bankrupt. If you don't do something, I'm bankrupt. And these people will go up to him and say, well, I'll sell you a dove or I'll sell you this or that so that then maybe you can go ask God for forgiveness or for help. They had made it a place of commerce. But what was Jesus' heart? And this is still his heart today. When we come before him in his presence, this is Jesus' heart. And it goes on. Verse 14. And he said, and the blind and the lame came to him into the temple, and he healed them. And when the chief priests, the scribes, saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple, that same cry, Hosanna to the son of David, save us, son of David. They were indignant. They, they turned their face from it. They, they, they sneered at it. Look, going on. And he said, do you hear? They said, do you hear what he is saying? And Jesus says, yes. Have you never read out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants? You have perfected praise. There's another, uh, I forget which book it is. It says, if they weren't crying out, the very rocks would cry out. And it goes on. And he left them in the city and he lodged. In Bethany, what you see, it's, it's the account I want to say, hang on real quick. The one I was looking for is the account, what you see is right after this. It says, all those who were lame and hurting, he healed them. And he healed them all. What happened is, he got rid of these who had been merchandising what God had intended to be free to all who would come. And Jesus touches the lame and the blind and the hurting, and he begins to heal each of them. When, when the people are praising him and trying to raise him up, what is Jesus' heart? He knows he's going to the cross in just days. And he said, no, you hurting, you broken, you come to me and be made well. That was his heart then. And that was his heart when he was on the cross. 
And he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. It was his heart then. And it was his heart when he sees his disciples for the first time. When he's raised. When he's raised, when that tomb is empty. And what does he do? He says, go and tell the disciples and Peter. What do we know about Peter? Peter denied him. Not once, but three times. Even to a child, Peter denied him. This man who said, God, I'm going to go all the way. God, I'm going to be strong enough for you. And in his own strength, he failed. But what did Jesus do? As Jesus always does, he took the broken, he took the hurting, and he said, that's why I came. Come to me. He always makes a way. David Wilkerson one time said, God always makes a way for a praying man. God always makes a way for a praying woman. God always makes a way. God always makes a way. But sometimes in the midst of our pain, in the midst of our hurting, I was reading that Matthew 21, and in my mind I just kept thinking, the lame, the blind, the hurting were there the whole time. But nobody saw them until Jesus walked in. God is faithful. When we put aside the things of our own control, our own hopes, our own dreams, and we say, God, our life is not my own. My life is yours. God will do amazing things in his people. So as we talk about this Feast of Purim, um, it represents a time in history. We were talking about all the changes that have happened even in the last 50 years. From space travel to phones to, who remembers pagers? Like, that was a thing, and bag phones, and computers, and all of that. God is just, we're in such a time of a fast-paced environment. We have information at his fingertips. I was talking uh, to a family member, and I was like, we have all this stuff right within our reach. We have every book, every medication, every, everything you could think of. And we're more depressed, we're more broken, we're more suicidal than any other time in any other generation in the world. And what do we see in the world? God, get out of our court system. God, get out of our schools. God, God get out of everything that's not these four walls. And you better not say anything online... And you better not say anything that might offend. And what does God say? He says, my house, my, my, this, this place is a house of prayer. You know your homes should be a house of prayer. You know when you're at work, that's a house of prayer. Wherever and whenever God puts your feet, God can do amazing things. You know, there's times I've seen God move more powerfully in a thought out, not spoken prayer. Where I've seen God in the, in the EMS unit literally heal somebody with a thought. Not even speaking it out loud because God knows the thoughts, the intents of the heart. And he knows the cry of faith that just says, God, move on behalf of this person. Move on behalf of this broken one. And God still does that. How much more for his people? Well, in the time of Esther, you have this pagan king, this Persian king, a sir, uh, how do you say it? I don't want to butcher it the whole night. Ahasuerus, which I'm, Azur, Ahasuerus, thank you. I knew I was going to butcher it. Thank y'all. Thank y'all. Love the body of Christ. Uh, Ahasuerus, he throws this, months-long party, celebrating all his wealth, all of his power. And at the end of that, he holds this seven-day festival. He invites his wife, his queen, Vashti at that time. She refuses to come. She gets booted out of that office. God, uh, there begins to be this search for a new queen. And I love how God works. Even in the midst of of something that seems like it would have no effect on the kingdom of God. This pagan king, God raises up Esther, gives her favor, 
puts her in a position of power. She becomes queen. And that's where I want to pick up our story. Esther chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. It says, After these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, the son of Ahamathada, the Agagite, and advanced him and set, him, set his seat above all the princes who were with him. You know what's so interesting? When I, when I saw that and I was reading this, I was like, God, why would you even put Haman in that position? Why even promote him at all? Why don't you just promote Mordecai in the beginning and call it a day? Chapter 3, chapter 4, Mordecai becomes the second in command and all as well. But no, because God is doing something. God is doing something greater that is going to help the people that even as of this last Sunday, they still celebrate today. That happened how many thousands? 3,000 years ago? 2,500 years ago? Something like that? And it's still recognized by the people of God because God was raising up a testimony that was going to stay with this people and it was going to help us even today. And it said, And all the king's servants who were within the king's gate bowed and paid homage to Haman. For so the king had commanded concerning him. But Mordecai would not bow down or pay homage. Then the king's servants who were within the king's gate said to Mordecai, Why do you transgress the king's command? See, Mordecai is saying, I will bow to none other than than the God of Israel. I will not bow down to a man. I will not bow down to the order of the day. I'm reminded of Joshua on his deathbed going, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Even if everybody else bows down to this world, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And we see this in Mordecai. So they tell him, why are you transgressing the king's command? Now it happened when they spoke to him daily, and he would not listen to him that they told Haman. Day after day after day. And he refused. All he had to do was bow down. But he said, I can't do that. I can't bow to the, the spirit of the age. I can't bow to this man. And it says, and Haman was filled with wrath. But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone. For they had told him of the people of Mordecai, God's people. And instead, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews who were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. The people of Mordecai, the first month, which is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast purr. That is the lot before Haman to determine the day and the month until it fell on the twelfth month, the month of Adar. They're casting lots for the termination of an entire race of people. Think about that. Think about the hatred and the bitterness in this man, all because one person wouldn't bow to him. The hatred. I'm reminded of the hatred of Hitler that just sought to destroy the Jews. I'm reminded of current modern day. How many of those countries around Israel desire to destroy them? It's no coincidence, but God always makes a way for a praying people. God always makes a way. Jump ahead to Esther chapter 4. If you haven't read this in a while, go back and read Esther. It's, it's pretty amazing. I was so thankful to spend the time with, with God's Word over several days, just reading and, and, and taking this in. Esther chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. It says, When Mordecai learned all that had happened, because what happened is, basically, Haman sets it in his heart to destroy all of God's people. And he basically kind of manipulates the king into signing a, a decree. 
And this decree goes out to all the cities. And everywhere it goes out, the people of God begin to cry out to him. So it goes on. It says, When Mordecai had learned all that had happened, he tore his clothes. He put on sackcloth and ashes. And he went into the midst of the city. Of the city. He cried out with a loud and bitter cry. And he went as far as the front of the king's gate, for no one might enter the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. And in every province where the king's command and decree arrived, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting, with weeping, with wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. God always makes a way for a praying people. Skip ahead to Esther chapter 6. Don't get discount what God can do. When we pray, we trust, and we seek. This amazes me. This, some of this, it's actually semi-comical when you read the story of this. Because you see, we get the bird's eye view of what God's doing. What I was reminded of is imagine living. And I tried to read Esther this time thinking, what must it have been like living in that day and under that pressure, that pain? That struggle, knowing that the clock is ticking and that the very place you live, change is coming. Something's going to change. Something's going to happen. That's undeniable. But what that is, God has not fully let them know. But what is their part in the midst of the struggle? What is their part in the midst of the pain? Seek His face. Don't try to figure it out. Don't try to, don't try to, to, to just, if you're like me, I'm a type A personality. When something's happening, I try to just fix it. That's not always the best thing. Pray, seek God's heart, and then move forward. Man, I don't know if any of you are like that. Darlene sometimes laughs at it because I'm a fixer. And there's sometimes where it's best, the best fix you can do sometimes is just listening. Listening to the Lord, listening to those he's raised up around you to be a help. To just sit in his presence and say, God, I need you. God, I need you to answer. And I'm not moving until you answer. God, I'm not moving. But look at how God works. We fast forward to Esther chapter 6. Verse 1, and it says this. It says, that night the king could not sleep. So one was commanded to bring the book of the record of the Chronicles, and they read it before the king. This guy can't sleep. Most powerful man in the whole kingdom. And what does he say? Hey, can you bring a history book to help me sleep? Think about that. That's not the top of my list when I can't sleep at night. Well, let me read about world history. Let's do that. Let's read about world history. Now, as we read this, I don't think it's any coincidence he couldn't sleep. Because watch what happens. He says, verse 2, it says, And it was found written that Mordecai had told of Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs, the doorkeepers, who had sought to lay hands on King uh, Ahasuerus. Thank you, Jesus. That is kind of funny, but thank you. Then the king said, What honor and dignity has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? And the king's servants who attended to him said, Nothing has been done for him. So the king said, Who is in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the king's palace to suggest to the king to hang Mordecai on the gallows that he had prepared for him. Think about this. Mordecai is sitting in the king's gate and he's seeing this gallow, this, this hangman's block, if you want to say it, sitting up, elevated above the city. And he's sitting there, and he's praying, and he's seeking God's heart. And he's saying, God, if you don't move, guess where I'm going? 
God, if you don't move, if you don't do something, I'm going to die by that, and your people are going to die by the sword. God, you've got to move. And I just, I, I kept having that thought in my mind. Can you imagine being there? And every time you look up, you see that thing that looks just like death. It looks so impossible, so unbeatable. And you just have to continue to pray. And you have to continue to fight. And you have to continue to say, I know my God is faithful. And I know my God loves me. And I know my God's going to come through. And you have to hold to it. You have to, and we're going to need this church in these last days more than you can know. To be able to, in the midst of the struggle, say, my Jesus loves me. And he's in it with me. And just like he kicked the money changers out and he went to the poor and broke it. And it says, uh, it's either, it's either in, in Mark or Luke. It says, in all those who came to him, he healed them. Literally, hours, hours, 48 hours, 72 hours from the time he would be arrested and beaten and crucified. But his heart is for the broken. And it's still that way. And I hear that and I read this story. And I'm just thinking, what must Mordecai have been thinking? But look at how God works. It just so happened by chance. Haman, this man who wants to destroy the Jews, happened to enter the outer court of the king's palace. I'm sure it's early in the morning because the king couldn't sleep the night before. Haman's coming in there excited because the gallows are built. Watch, my vengeance is going to come. But watch what God does. It said, the king's servant said to him, Haman is there standing in the court. And the king said, let him come in. So Haman came in and the king asked him, what shall be done for the man whom the king delights to honor? So Haman now thought in his heart, whom would the king delight to honor more than me? This man who's desiring to destroy God's people. Look at the wickedness of his heart. And Haman answered the king, For the man whom the king delights to honor, let a royal robe be brought which the king has worn, and a horse on which the king has ridden, and which has the royal crest placed on its head. And let this robe and horse be delivered to the hand of of one of the king's most noble princes, that he may array the man whom the king delights to honor. Then parade him on horseback through the city square and proclaim before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. And the king said to Haman, Hurry, take the robe and the horse as you have suggested, and do so for Mordecai the Jew, who sits within the king's gate. Leave nothing undone of all that you have spoken. Only God can do that. So Haman took the robe and the horse, arrayed Mordecai, and led him on horseback through the city square and proclaimed before him, Thus shall it be done for the man whom the king delights. Now thinking of the way, how, much, how must that have been? Can you imagine Mordecai is on this horse, arrayed in a robe, walking around, and the gallows are right looking over him the whole time. Feels like a celebration, but I bet you it didn't feel like a celebration. But God was still doing something. God was still working. Goes on, verse 12. Afterward, Mordecai went back to the king's gate, but Haman hurried to his house, mourning with his head covered. And when Haman told his wife Zeresh of all his friends, and all his friends, everything that had happened to him, his wise men and his wife Zeresh said to him, If Mordecai, before whom, who, before whom you have begun to fall, is of Jewish descent, you will not prevail against him, but will surely fall before him. And while they were still talking with him, the king's eunuchs, eunuchs came and hastened to bring Haman to the banquet which Esther had prepared. What we see in chapter 4, two verses earlier, is Mordecai tells Esther, says, you've got to go before the king. You've got to plead for, for God's people. 
You got to do it. And I love Mordecai's response. And he says, and if you don't, if not by your hand, God will raise up someone. God will raise up and save his people. God will do it. If it's not by your hand, God will still do it. And you will perish with the others. And Esther says, if I perish, I perish. Because she knows she's going before the king. And she hasn't been summoned. And she hadn't been called. But she's holding to what she knows. And she says, I love her heart. Remember, God hears the prayers. God moves for the praying man or for the praying woman. Esther tells Mordecai, tell the people for these three days to fast and pray. And I will do the same. And then I will go before the king. And the king gives her favor. So Esther says, I want to put on this banquet. And I want you, king, to be there, and I want Haman to be there. And the king says, okay. Jump ahead to, to Esther chapter 7. So the first day, she doesn't tell the king or Haman what is going on. But the second day, then Queen Esther answered and said... If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life be given to me at my petition and my people at my request. For we have been sold, my people and I, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. Had we been sold as male or female slaves, I would, not, I would have held my tongue, although the enemy could never compensate the kings for the king's loss. King Ahasuerus answered and said to Queen Esther, Who is he and where is he who would dare presume in his heart to do such a thing? And Esther said, The adversary, the enemy, is that wicked Haman. So Haman was terrified before the king and queen. And the king arose in his wrath from the banquet of wine and placed and went into the palace garden. But Haman stood before Queen Esther pleading for his life. For he saw that evil was determined against him by the king. When the king returned from the palace garden to the place of the uh, banquet of wine, Haman had, had fallen across the couch where Esther was. And the king said, Will he also assault the queen while I am in the house? As the words left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. Now, Har Harbone, one of the eunuchs, said to the king, Look, the gallows, 50 cubits high, which Haman made for Mordecai, who spoke good on the king's behalf, is standing at the house of Haman. And the king said, Hang him on it. So they hanged Haman on the gallows he had prepared for Mordecai. And then the king's wrath subsided. What the enemy meant for evil, God turned it for good. God did a work. This very thing that looked like it was going to represent death actually represented life. God was going to do something. He was going to save his people, and God still saves his people. Hosanna, save us. Please save us. Once again, a cry all the way back then, save us. And he was no less Hosanna then than he was in his day, than he is now. He's still a God who saves. Now it goes on. Esther chapter 9, verses 20 through 28. This order is given. Well, let's read it. Esther chapter 9, verse 20 to 28. It says, And Mordecai wrote these things and sent letters to all the Jews. It was a proclamation to say that the Jewish people could arm themselves defend themselves and to group together and to fight this force coming against them, this force desiring to destroy God's people. So Mordecai, the king approves this. Mordecai wrote these things and sent letters to all the Jews near and far who were in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus to establish among them that they should celebrate yearly the 14th and 15th months of Adar. So this is fast forwarding ahead. God actually miraculously saves his people. 
uh, there's, uh, I, it, it should say it here shortly, the ones that had come against God's people, God's people survived and they did not. The ones who meant evil, God did something that was amazing. And what they say is after that, these letters go out and they say, we want to remember this day from here on out to every generation that when we come across these situations where it seems impossible, God always makes a way. And every year I want you to remember this, how God made a way when there was no way. How the one you cried out to save you did just that. To establish, verse 21, among them, that they should celebrate yearly the 14th and the 15th day, days of the month of Adar. Those were the days that were set aside to kill God's people. But God made it a day. He made mourning from, he made, uh, from ashes beauty, from mourning to joy. God did something that only God can do. As the days, verse 22, on which the Jews had rest from their enemies. Rest. As the month which was turned from sorrow to joy for them. And from mourning to a holiday that they should make them days of feasting and joy and sending presents to one another and gifts to the poor. <laughs> I couldn't help but see the parallel. Keep in mind, we were just sharing on, on Palm Sunday and talking about coming up to the resurrection. You remember when Jesus was crucified, the disciples mourned. Fearfully, they gathered together. They were spread. They were separated. But when that stone was rolled away and that tomb was empty, what happened to their mourning? Their mourning was turned to joy. And I think, I find it funny now. I'm like, and we celebrate a holiday. Now every year, recognizing how God made a way when his people could see no way. And if Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, God still makes a way for a praying people that will trust him, that will press into him. Because I live, John 14 says, you will live also. Because I live. Thank you, Jesus. God is faithful. And God does amazing things. And God always has a remnant people. I shared just briefly on it. I think of Noah's Ark. How, how God, for decades, Noah was building this ark. And I'm sure sharing the testimony of the Lord. There's rain coming. There's rain coming. We just talked about it in our men and women's parable Bible studies. What does Jesus say? What are his last words when he knows the cross is coming? He says, be ready, be watchful, and know the hour you live in. Know because I am returning for my people that love me, those that are called by my name that stand in every hour, even when it seems impossible. God does amazing things with the impossible. And why does he do it? He does it to raise up a testimony. You remember the blind man where the disciples go, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Surely he did something to cause his suffering. And God goes, no, but for the glory of God, this man was born blind. And then what does Jesus do? Heals his eyes and the man can see. And the man immediately begins to testify of the goodness of God. God doesn't waste our pain. He doesn't waste our prayers. He doesn't waste our struggle, but he does something amazing. God, a long time ago, I was helping somebody fill out a resume. And I, I just kept thinking, God gives Christians resumes. Of times, if we think of it that way, where we can go back through our history and go, God was so faithful here. And God was so faithful here. And God was faithful here. And even when I walked away, even when I struggled, God was still faithful. And God is still faithful. Even when I doubted, even when my faith was at its weakest point, look, God came through. God heard my weak and pathetic prayer in that moment. 
It wasn't filled with these and those and all this stuff. It was just God save us. God do a work. God heal my heart. God, I'm overwhelmed. God, I'm struggling. And he said, okay, now I can. Now, because I live, you can live. You're not going to figure it out in your own strength. You're going to figure it out in your weakness and in my power. I'm going to do something. I know you see the gallows that seem impossible, that seem like this day is coming, and they all knew the day. They knew the 14th and 15th day. God, if you don't move by this day, we're done. God, you have to move. And they come to a place where they go, all we can do is pray and fast and look to our God and see what our God will do. Can you imagine if the people knew beforehand? No, God's going to come through. You're going to be fine. Do you think they would have still prayed? Do you think they still would have fought and said, God, you've got to help us. But God was doing something. In here, God was doing something. And God still does something in us through our struggles. But God is so faithful, church. Oh, hold to him. I don't even know. It seems like words aren't even enough to say how faithful God is. I was thinking about how many years are we now? From not our marriage, but 26 years. <laughs> Have you not been listening to the message? I'm talking about struggles. And I'm not the, uh, how long? Ha, how long have you been cancer free? 16 years. 16 years ago, she was told she was going to die. 10 year anniversary. Speaking of wedding anniversaries. Sure felt too short. You're going to die. You're going to die. Can you imagine seeing those gallows and just going, God, we've tried medicine. We've tried everything else, God. We've tried chemo. We've tried surgery. And if you don't move, God, we're done. And God took us to a place where he said, whether I take you to heaven or whether I heal you on earth, you win. It's a victory and I'm doing something. But what did God say? He said, I had to take you through that. And he did heal her miraculously. I had to take you through that because I had to do something in here that I couldn't get at. I couldn't get at with your, your comfort. I had to get at it with your sorrow. I had to. I love you. You know, I, I, I just have this picture of God going, you know how much it hurt to watch you go through that? But I had a plan, and I had a purpose, and I still have a plan and a purpose. Church, God is faithful. I don't know what our individual hearts are online, what your hearts are, but God is faithful, and God hears you. But you got to pray. you got to fast. you got to come to his presence. And I'm not even talking about physical fasting. Sometimes it's just a fast of the I want. And saying, God, what I want is I want you. I want you. And God, if I don't have you, I'm done. God still moves for his people. God still moves. God still heals. And God still prevails. God created an ark, and the whole world had a choice, and yet only a handful entered that ark. Nobody wanted any part of it until it started raining, and then everybody wanted in. God still prepares an ark for his people, and that is Christ Jesus, that anybody that will cry out, save us, anybody that will cry out, Hosanna, God says, come, come. I'm, I'm going to do something, even though it looks impossible. God is faithful. Ephesians chapter 3. That's probably the fastest I've ever covered the book of Esther. <laughs> that was like the, the Cliff Notes version of Esther. Seriously, try to go back and read it. It's a beautiful book of God's provision 
uh, God's grace. Uh, God's purpose, God's ability to do anything in anyone at any time for his glory and for his honor. Ephesians 3, verse 8 through 12, it says, To me who am less than the least of all the saints, was uh, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles, that's us, the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages was hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, according to the eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom, I love verse 12, in whom, who we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. That's the key. That's the key to the access is by faith. It's not by works. It's not by our abilities. It's not by our strength. It's by faith we enter in. To because I live, you live. It's by faith. And what's awesome is it's not even a lot of faith. It's the smallest amount of weakness and faith that comes honest and just goes, God, Jesus, I need you. Come through. God, I'm going to sit in your presence. I'm going to wait. And I'm going to watch the power and the glory of God move. And it's going to be for your glory, Lord. God, don't, don't let me go through this for nothing, God. But let it be a, a, a testimony, just like we just read in Esther. A testimony that till the day I die, I'm going to proclaim God's goodness. I'm going to proclaim that when I was without strength, when I was failing, God came through. And God did a work. How many stories are in this room of God coming through? God making a way when there was no way. God helping us in our pain to bring a purpose. God's plan is so beautiful. And someday, if we stand and if we hold fast, he says, someday you will be with me. To die on this earth is victory. Not that we want to to die earlier than we need to, however God desires that to look. But, oh, God, to be in his presence is victory. It's life. It's life eternal. God gives us a small time on this earth and says, be faithful. Trust me. Press in. Press in and watch what I'll do. And what I'm so thankful of is he does it in love, not in anger. God is faithful. Because I live, you will live also. John 14, 18 and 19. And as we bring this to a close, I want to look at one last scripture. Because I remember these questions. I remember, I didn't even see them bringing up our story, but God is faithful. And I remember, I remember this, this, uh, this chapter and, and these verses. And God took me there this afternoon, actually. And I was reading it, and it reminded me of something. If we can go to that scripture, I think it's 4027. It says, Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord. And my just claim has passed over, was pa is passed over by my God. Israel is crying out, going, God, we're seeking you and we're not hearing you. God, you're not moving the way we're asking you to move. And our enemies surround us. God, what do we do? You're not listening. God, you don't hear us. But God hears them. 
God is doing something the whole time. But the ears are blocked. Their, their, their eyes are blocked sometimes by their own pain, by their own struggle, by their own doubt, by their own fears. But look at this. They're crying out and they're saying, God, we've, we've put a just claim before you. We've, we've asked you to help us with something that's reasonable. And what is God's answer? Verse 28. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, he neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak. And to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youths shall faint. Our own strength will fail. Even, even the, the young people, even the youths who should have power and strength and, and all those things that come with being young, right? I'll just leave it at that. I'm 49 now. We were out there a hammer and rebar, and I'm like, I'm moving too much. I'm going to be sore later. Um, shall faint and be weary. The young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. When I was without strength, when I was without power, but God did something amazing. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Church, our God is faithful. As we come into this season, as we come into this weekend, it's more than a holiday. It's a reminder of God's faithfulness to every generation. Because I live, you live also. Church, take this as a reminder and just hold on to it. I needed this the last few weeks. What God's been putting on my heart um, these last two messages, I've needed personally. Just that reminder of his faithfulness, that reminder of his goodness, that reminder that my God is working something even when I don't understand it. Even if I would write the script so different, God says, but I'm moving and I'm working and I'm going to come through for you because my people... I always have a remnant of my people that are faithful just to say, in my weakness, I'm going to stand in your strength and I'm going to trust you. So my heart for us tonight, I just want to pray and then we'll, we'll do announcements and close out, is just to say tonight, hold to the faithfulness of God, church. Hold to his faithfulness. Be reminded of God's goodness through the years. And God's faithfulness. I think of how many Thanksgiving scriptures are there in the Bible where people would cry out even in their pain and just say, but God, I know your character. I know your goodness. I don't understand it, but I know you're doing something. And I'm going to stand and I'm going to wait and I'm going to watch and I'm going to be ready. And God, when you move, when you move, I'm going to proclaim it to everyone. I'm not going to be the same after that. But God, I'm going to be a faithful witness. I'm going to stand. I'm going to proclaim. I'm going to stand in your goodness. And when I see my brother or sister struggling with the same thing, I can do like that Corinthian scripture. With the same comfort I've been comforted, I can go to them and be like, I know it seems impossible, but hold on. God is doing something. Just hold on and watch and wait and pray, and be ready, and watch the power of God give you strength in your weakness, and watch Him move, because He is faithful, the Bible says, even when we are not. He is faithful, because He cannot deny His own character. That is the God we serve. So to God be the glory. Father God, we thank You for Your goodness. Those online, those in this room, may they be strengthened as that Isaiah scripture we just read. To go, oh God, we don't understand it.
God, we're crying out, and we want an answer now. And God's answer is, I'm the God of everlasting. I take those who are weary, and I give them my strength, my help, my provision. And thank you, Jesus, that your love never fails. Your heart for us never fails. Thank you, God, that it's not about performance. It's not about ability. It's about weakness and faith and standing in the impossible and saying, but for God, but for God. God is faithful. And so, God, strengthen the resolve of your people tonight. Everyone who hears this message tonight and later, strengthen their heart in whatever they're going through to go, my God is faithful. Even when I don't see it, even when I don't feel it, even when uh, I'm, I'm confused, I'm going to stand on the truth of who you are. And I'm going to hold to you. Because, God, you don't owe me an explanation, God. Your cross was the explanation. God, your cross made a way, and I'm going to hold to you. And this weekend's a reminder of the goodness of God and his desire like it was way back then is to come in to the temple, the place of his presence, which church, it's, not, it's us. We represent the temple of God. And he goes, I'm going to come in and I'm going to heal the broken. I'm going to, I'm going to give sight to the blind. Uh, I'm, I'm going to help the, the lame to leap and to walk. And the Bible said, all who came were healed. Whose temple you are if you belong to the Lord. So I ask God that you would heal hearts. You would, you would strengthen resolve. God, even if, if, if the answer isn't coming today, Lord God, there would be something in the heart that goes, I don't know when it's coming, but my God is faithful. And God, may we hold to that. May we hold to your character. May we believe, Lord God, even when it looks impossible, that you're doing a work and that you are faithful. God, go before your people tonight. Strengthen, strengthen their weakness, Lord God, if I can even put it that way. That we can be weak, that your strength is perfected. God, go before us. Go before us. Open your word to your people. God, just a sweet time of prayer with your people and you in their quiet time, Lord God. When they open your word, God, I just ask this week that you would just bring such a peace of your presence before your people. God, that you would do a mighty work and you would raise a standard, raise a testimony in, in, in each, each heart and each mind. God, that we would just hold to you in faith. And God, stand in you in faith and believe you for the impossible, Lord God. And because you live, we live also. And for that, we give you glory all the days of our lives. In Jesus' precious name, amen and amen. Thank you, Jesus. What announcements do we have? Bread drop Friday. Bread drop Friday. So we have a bread drop this Friday. We will not have one that following Friday. The first Friday of April, we're not going to have a bread drop. So this is one of those pantry weeks where you have three weeks in between. And then we'll pick everything back up that second week of April. So bread drop this Friday, no bread drop next Friday. Um, other than that, a reminder, men and women's Bible studies. We just finished our last parable study. That was, what, almost a year-long study. And then we're going to take two weeks off. We're going to come back for a joint Tuesday night, men and women, uh, Tuesday the 16th. Thank you, Robert. Uh, Tuesday the 16th here at the church. That's going to kick that off, and then we'll, we'll split up into our individual groups. And I think we're going to try to do the men and women's joint one like once a quarter. Uh, it's fun to do, but we also um, like having the time and the freedom for us to share in smaller groups. So that's been awesome. Uh, what else do we got? Evangelism, April 6th. Um, you can see Pastor Randy or Clement on that. Um, they'll be helping with that. I know, I know for sure Clement's been kind of helping spearhead some of that. And so uh, just with either of them, they can help you. Darlene, I won't be here uh, that time, so I won't be able to go for that one. But evangelism, come be a part of that. And then um, sign up for the Oh. 
Hard to believe, but VBS in June. We're already there. We're signing volunteers up, kiddos up. Uh, it's going to be a good time in the Lord. So we're excited for that. Other than that, God bless you. I love you. Have a wonderful and blessed uh, rest of your week. And we'll see you Friday at the offload or Resurrection Sunday. God bless you.